All right, if you have your Bibles with you this morning, we'd ask you to turn to the book of 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 2, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. 1 Peter chapter 2, in the very first verse, the Bible says, Wherefore, laying aside all malice, and all guile, and hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the Word, that we may grow thereby. If so, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also are lively stones, uh, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I lay, on, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them that it be disobedient, the stone that the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye may shew forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness, into His marvelous light. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank You. We praise You for all that You do for us. Lord, we're happy and glad this morning that we, we stand in Your forgiveness and we praise You for that. Lord, we pray this morning that You would allow us to uh, focus in on You for a short time and what You've given us as a people here together. Lord, we pray that You would... Uh, uh, forgive our sins, Lord, and that we would be found people that would be uh, worthy to hear from You this morning. We pray that You'd speak to us. Lord, we pray if there's anything that uh, stands in the way of us and You, Lord, that You'd allow us to confess it and remove it. According to Your mercy and grace, we pray it. Amen. Now, uh, we see some very familiar verses of Scripture, and we really be preaching this morning... Uh, uh, regarding uh, what kind of people that we as the Lord's people were to be. Uh, we're going to be preaching uh, being uh, uh, in the will of the Lord when we need to be. And the first verse the Bible says, Wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies. Now, as uh, Peter is writing, he gives a very difficult bill to fill because if we want to get to the point of serving the Lord and knowing the Lord intimately, we have to lay some things aside. And the most difficult thing that you will ever do is effectively lay this flesh aside and, and, and do something else to focus in on the Lord. And so Peter, knowing this, and, and we'll see from Peter's own testimony that he had a challenge with this time and time again. And Peter, understanding this, he wrote to all the churches, and that means it was a consistent problem, uh, of the very same thing. Wherefore, laying aside all malice. Now, malice is, 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 a, is a type of hate that lays dormant. It's a badness. Uh, the word malo means bad or, 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 or ugly or dirty. And he says, you're going to have to lay those things aside. Now, it's very easy of us as the Lord's people to think about things like pornography or alcohol or something like that and say, yeah, all that needs to be laid aside. Well, what about contempt? Uh, what about uh, being upset with your brother or sister in Christ? What about uh, dressing the way the Lord's people ought to dress? See, when it says all, everything that's bad, we need to lay that aside. Now, uh, in this flesh, we know that that's an impossibility. But if you want communion with the Lord, you better try. You better try. And, and so we as the Lord's people, uh, the very first thing we need to do is, in the best of our ability, is to lay the malice aside. Wherefore, 
turned aside all malice and all guile. Now, guile is a, is a bitterness or a foulness. Guile literally means bitter. And, and you know what? Uh, this life is going to send you some things that's going to make you bitter over the years. It's going to send. It's going to bring some events in your life that that if you're not very very careful, the events will make you bitter. It will make you upset at religion. It will make you upset at people that you thought you loved. That is the nature uh, of what we're dealt with. So it, it, that malice. And the guile, it has to be laid aside. Yeah. If, you want, if you want close communion with the Lord, and listen, I, it's easy to preach about and, e and easy to articulate these things out, but the application is very difficult actually following through. And hypocrisies. Now, everybody, uh, you know, that, that's the big thing today is uh, blaming everything on a hypocrite. A hypocrite is uh, what we think of as somebody saying, well, uh, I, I tell you to do something, but I do the opposite myself. It's like, well, you're a hypocrite. Well, uh, you're going to meet lots of them. Uh, I, wish, I wish the ministry didn't have hypocrites, but you know what? There's a lot of hypocrite in me. Uh, there is a lot of hypocrite in all believers. You know why? Because we still have this flesh to deal with. That's right. And, and, and so, if, if we're going to have the close communion that, that, that is such a blessing and such an effectiveness in the things of God, what we have to do is lay those things aside and, and don't focus on it and don't stress about it and don't worry about it because if we do that, something stands between us and serving the Lord even as we should. Um, then he says, and all evil speakings. Uh, talking about others. You know, we think of uh, foul language when we think of evil speaking, but you know what? Uh, just what we speak concerning each other has a great deal to do with, uh, with, with the way that we approach the Lord. Verse 2, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the world, word, that we may grow thereby. Now, listen, uh, uh, if we set all this aside, then we'll be hungry. Now, listen, when, when Donna delivers a, new, a, a newborn baby, if that baby doesn't have what we call a suck reflex, something is wrong. The baby's not healthy. The baby's not good. If he doesn't have a natural desire to nurse, there's a problem somewhere. And you know what? I see among the Lord's people today, they're losing their drive to nurse. They're, they're losing their drive to latch on and enjoy the Word of God. And a lot of it is this. It's the worldliness that we have around us. Yeah. And the worldliness that... And, and so the Word of God really isn't that important to us anymore. So... You have to come out, okay, if I'm not enjoying the Word of, word of God, but I should, what do I have in my life that's the problem? Because we've just seen all four of those items that, that we as the Lord's people ought to, be, ought to be calling, getting rid of the very best that we can. And, and, and that's what He advises us to do. Uh, verse 3, if, if you've so tasted that the Lord is gracious... Now, if you don't get anything else this morning, you look at that one carefully. If you've so tasted that the Lord is gracious, have you tasted that the Lord Jesus Christ is a gracious, marvelous Savior? And so he, he goes from removing the problems in your life, the, 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 the devil's attempt at loading your life with sin, you, you, you get that out, and, and then do you have a drive to understand and enjoy the Word of God? And then, and then lastly, in verse 3, he says, uh, he, 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 says very, he, he says very clearly, if you've tasted that the Lord is gracious. So, in other words, saved people will have a drive toward the Lord God. Now, there'll be a lot of hardships on the way, but when all the dust settles, what will still be important to them is the, is the Lord God. When many other times it's other things that's important to other people. Where they're at, what they're doing, what's their prestige, what's going on. And, and so he gives them a very, uh, as Peter's writing, he gives them a very clear idea of what redemption is about, and if redemption is present, they will have a drive toward the Lord God. Verse 4, To whom coming as into a living stone, disallowed indeed 
wicked men, but chosen of God and precious. Meaning Christ. And then he says in verse 5, You are also lively stones, are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. And so he says, You are to be a lively stone. In other words, you're an altar in and of yourself. When, when, you let, when you let these things go, you are making a sacrifice unto the Lord. We as Lord's people need to lift Him up. If there's anything that, that our type of people have let go, it's lifting up the name of Jesus. Just saying, you know, you are high and lifted up. You're marvelous and great. Uh, I, I was looking last night, uh, me and I were sitting there in the front room, and uh, I, was, uh, I was looking at my phone, and uh, this cemetery, uh, near his mother and daddy, and I, I think maybe her grandparents too, is buried in it, down at Long Creek, and now some of those, you can, when, you, when you click on the grave, their obituary will pop, will pop up to you. And it was this woman, she was a big, it's probably Ken And uh, 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 And all it said of her, and, and it threw up my heart and I read it to Donna, all it said was that she was converted as a young child and lived a godly, holy life. You know, what a wonderful thing that could be said to you. And in a very short, you know, it wasn't about how many 55 kids she had. It was just that she served God with her life. That's what this is talking about. Use your life as a sacrifice. Use your life as an altar while you have it. Because see, it would be a day when, when we don't have the drive and we don't have the ability. He says, so you are lively or living stones. Use yourself here and now. Verse 6, Wherefore also it is contained in the Scripture, Behold, I, lie, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Now, uh, that word confounded means confused or stopped. If I'm walking along here, this, this pew confounds me. It stops me in my tracks. It's in my way. And he says here, if we belong to Christ, we're not going to be confounded. Now, everybody wants to jump up and down on the two book. You know, totally per, 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 But you know the one that never gets you many amens? It's the P. The perseverance of the saints. Yeah. And everybody wants to, you know, put the security of the believer in there, and I believe the believer is secure. But you know what perseverance really is? It means you'll last. It means at the end you'll still be standing. It means that uh, when, when, when you have the horrid hairs, it's predicted in the Bible that you'll still be doing the very best that you can to stand true to the Word of God. Yeah. See, that's perseverance of the saints. And he's saying here, the, the ones that are really redeemed, they're not going to be confounded. Yes, you're going to have some bad days. Yes, there's going to be some difficulty. When, when all the dust settles and the, and the disturbances of the, uh, and the dust of the events is settled, you'll still be standing tall. Verse 7. Unto you, therefore, verse 7, unto you, therefore, which believe He is precious, now, do you believe that this morning? Do you believe the Lord Jesus Christ is precious? Do you believe that He's close? Do, do you believe that He's... You know what? You know, something that's precious is rare. Something that's precious is a commodity. I believe He's precious to my life. Uh, I, I know this, I couldn't make it without Him. That's pretty precious, isn't it? Good, clean drinking water is precious, isn't it? Well, He's more precious than that. See, Peter understood, and we'll find out why just in a second, but Peter understood very, very much about a close relationship with the Lord. He says he's precious. And, and so, see, if you think he's precious, it will have a result in your life that speaks of the things of Christ on an everyday basis. And you therefore which who believe he is precious, unto them which is disobedient, the stone which the, the builder which the builders disallowed, the same is made head of the corner. Now, we do, we do know this. The Jews did not recognize Him nationally. There were, there were some saved believers. Peter was a, was, a, was a Jewish believer. But by and large, nationally, they didn't, under, they, they didn't recognize Christ as the Messiah, so He's disallowed. You know what? There are days in your line, if you don't tell me the same, there are days that I disobey.
allow Christ. In other words, I ignore Him on my way to work. I ignore Him on what I do. I don't present Him in the things. See, when, when you walk by somebody, you walk by something, and you don't take note of it, you disallow it. And we do that a great deal of time. You know what? Christ should be brought into everything that we do. Yeah, you know, the, the very reason we bow our heads and thank the Lord for our food is to, to acknowledge Him. He was the provider for it. He, he gave it to us. Everything that we do. And, and we live in a day and age today, I believe that what we're doing is, is just allowing Him in much of what we do. And if we bring Him back to the vocal front, I think everything else would fall in place. A, a verse 8, a stone of stumbling... And a rock of offense. You know, uh, that, that's, and everybody, and, and I understand the Jewish connotation here, I really do. But you know what? If Christ is not sufficient for you, He's a stumbling block to you too. If you have to say Christ in baptism, He's a stumbling block to you. If you have to say Christ in church membership, then He's a stumbling block to you, right? Because you stumble over it before you get to the next one, right? Christ plus nothing minus nothing. I'm glad I'm a Baptist. Being a Baptist has not saved my soul. Right? And, and so we see then uh, as the Lord's people that the, uh, very, very frequently He is not first in what we do. A, a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the Word, being disobedient, were into what? They were appointed. You know what? It, it, it should not be not a shock whatsoever that the Jews rejected Him. Yeah, it was predicted they would. Uh, it shouldn't be a shock whatsoever when there's only a handful to meet. That's how it's always been. Uh, it, it shouldn't stress us out and uh, uh, upset us any. We should already be able to give the praise and the glory for it. Verse 9. But He... Our chosen generation. Now, I want you to know that he's still talking to us today, too, because he's talking to the corporate church. He's talking to the church age. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. Now, we should be that people. We should be peculiar. We should be different. We should be odd. Uh, a peculiar people is specific. A peculiar people is a people that, 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 that are noted by certain traits, by, by, by how they present, by what they say, by what they do. That's a, that's a peculiarity of people today. And you know what? We live in a day and age where I believe the Lord's people are not as peculiar as they should be. And we, we will see that uh, an experience with Christ should make you that way. If you've really been born again, and you've really been saved, and the Lord has really uh, did a work of regeneration in your life, the end result, you know what? The, the Bible is very clear. The, the end result is always this, the peaceable fruit of righteousness. And if that's not present... And if that's not there, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, why should we believe that they was redeemed to start with? And so we as the Lord's people then, uh, we need to really look within ourselves. And you know, anytime you preach like that, people want to look at other people. But really the, the emphasis of this Scripture is to look at yourself. Yeah. Are you peculiar? Are you different? Are you specific to what this says? A peculiar people that you should shew forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. So I ask you this morning, what have you done to praise the Lord? Because that's what we are just called to do, right? Now each and every one of you, and I hope it was because of this, you got up because <laughs> you knew it was the Lord's day. You knew that this day belonged to Him. And you came in, and you know what? I'd be willing to bet people are watching you. And they're looking to see if you're getting up. And they're looking to see if you're going. And they're looking to see. Because you know what? That's a peculiar thing. Dude, listen, it, it, it is not the, this is not a day when a lot of people go to church. 
It's the day when people stay at home and watch ball games and eat and then do nothing for the cause of Christ. So it is a peculiarity to get up and to go. They're watching you. Yeah. Show forth His praise. Say, this is why I'm going. This is why I'm staying. This is what I'm doing. And we as the Lord's people, we, we, we need to engraft that into being part of our being because that is who we are to be. And so then the flip side is this, if we don't be peculiar, the darkness is going to overtake you. You look like and act like and present just like the rest of the world. We, we as the Lord's people, we need to be different. We need to look different. We need to present in a different way uh, than the average people of this world do. Go with me to the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 5, the very first verse. And uh, Luke's accounting of the calling of Peter. Luke chapter 5, in the very first verse, the Bible says, And it came to pass, as the, the people pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret. Now, I want you to see that uh, it's a very unusual day because people are interested in hearing the Word of God. They kind of they kind of press in on them. They, they, it was such a, a movement. Now, I'll say this, I think probably the majority of them that were there were there for the loaves and the fishes. But there was such an intense movement that he needed to get away from the shore a little bit. Verse 2. And, and saw the two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were gone out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat, upon, and he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep and let down your nets for a draw. And Simon answered and said, Master, we've told all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, I want you to notice uh, Peter's approach that uh, he was pretty self-sufficient and pretty self-confident. All right, I'm going to do it. I fished off. You know what? He was proud of the fact you know, that, that's not a way to answer your Lord. Did you ever think about that? I didn't know a way to answer your Lord. You know, you know what you know what the very best thing you could have done? Yes, sir. He didn't have to tell what he'd been doing all night. He didn't have to say, you know what? Uh, you know, all that did was try to make him look a little bit more bold, a little bit more smart. You know, we, we, we all have that issue time to time, do we not? And, and, and you know what? When the Lord gives us a command says to give Peter here, it should be yes, sir. Uh, right away. What would you have me to do? That, that's what's honoring to our Lord. It's just simple obedience. He doesn't need a dissertation. Just do what He bids you to do. Verse 21. Uh, uh, excuse me. I'm sorry. Verse 5. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we've told all night and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. And when they and when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes and their net break. And they beckoned unto the partners which were in the other ship that they should come. And they came and filled both ships to, the, to, the, to that that they began to sink. Now, see, when the Lord does a great thing, that there, there's no mistaking that He has met with you. You know what? Uh, I've had a lot of people, uh, and I think they're hard shell in their practice, but when you watch a motion, and I understand what they're saying to a point, but listen, uh, when, when, when you come into contact with God, there's an emotional response. And that, 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 that is just how, how it is because he's, he's made it that way. And there was no doubting at this instance that they had met with the Lord. And they got the fish. And they got another boat out there. They got so many fish in it. It started going down too. See, there's undenying it. 
what the Lord did. And you know, there was another time that He did this for them, and they even numbered the fish. And, and, and so the Lord is the master of these things, and certainly we ought to give Him the praise. And Peter was learning a great lesson that, you know what? He wasn't quite as smart as he thought he had been. Verse 7. I mean, excuse me, verse 8. And, and verse 8, when Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Now, I want you to see the, the result of being near unto Christ left Peter with the understanding that he had a personal issue. You know what? When, when we get close and nigh to Christ, everybody else's problems stay kind of in the background. Did you ever notice that? Because see, when we're in, when we're plugged in with the Lord, what you're really going to be interested in is your problem, and I'm going to be interested in my problem, and you're going to be interested in your problem, and you're going to be interested in your problem, and see, that's the way it ought to be, because when he had had this great experience with Christ, he understood who he was. In fact, he says, you know what? You don't even need to be around me. And you know what? Peter was in that sense right. He probably for the very first time saw himself as pretty inadequate. Because he was, he was a very self-sufficient kind of guy. Very, very much, uh, uh, you know, somewhat, you know, uh, I, 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 am, uh, I can handle this on my own. And this was, this was the end result. Go to the Gospel of John. John chapter 21. John 21 in the very first verse. And after these things, Jesus showed himself, showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and on this wise showed he himself. There were together Simon Peter and Thomas called, and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other of his disciples. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go fishing. Now listen, Peter wasn't just saying, I'm going to go out and get a few fish in. He was saying, I'm done. He was saying, I'm going back to my occupation. This thing of being an apostle and this thing of being a disciple of Christ I've done it for three and a half years. I'm going back to what I used to do. That'd be like me saying, you know what? I'm done with preaching. All I'm going to do is nursing. That's all I plan to do. That's exactly what Peter was saying. See, uh, you know what? You'd be lying to yourself this morning if you said that at times you felt the same way. I'm done. I'm through. And see, Peter, Peter was just that way. And, and he, he, was, uh, he, he, was, uh, he was past the point of quitting. He said, I'm going back to what I know what to do. The second part of verse 3 says, And they say unto him, We also go with thee. You have a little bit of leadership ability. You, you use it carefully. People follow leaders. You know, I'm a firm believer. Leaders are not trained. Leaders are born. God gives that. I believe it's a as a much of a gift as the gift of preaching. The gift of leadership. And so if you possess that, you'd be very careful. Now, if you're in a leadership position, fathers, you're placed there by the design of the family itself, use it. Ladies, you're in a leadership position. When your husband's away at work, the home's yours. Use it. <coughs> be, 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 be effective in it. Uh, follow what the Lord has given you to do. And, and so, he, I, when, when he made this broad statement, I don't think that Peter meant to impact everybody else, but he did. And when we make these broad statements sometimes, we don't necessarily mean what we're saying. That's why we need to temper our words, do we not? We need to think about what we're saying before we, before we say it and before we text it and all that stuff that goes in the modern day. Listen, words, once they're out there, you can't take them back. And so, we as the Lord's people, we need to be very careful about this. So when He made this broad statement, I don't think He really 
expected everybody to do the same thing, but they did. The second part of verse 3, uh, We also go with thee, and they went forth and entered into a ship, and immediately that night they caught nothing. But when the morning was come, Jesus stood on the shore, but Jesus, but the disciples knew not it was Jesus. Then Jesus saith unto them, Children, have you any meat? Now, I'll give you something to chew on this week. No! They did not have any meat. They most certainly had no meat of the Word. They had traveled with the Lord for three and a half years, and you know what? They was empty. Do you have any meat? If I died today, and y'all had two years to find a pastor, you going to make it without me? Do you have any meat? Children, do you have any meat? Because, you know, I can always tell someone that doesn't have meat. And it's always this way. They're quitters. You don't, you don't hear of the book of Thaddeus, do you? I don't know what happened to Thaddeus, but I do know this. You don't hear nothing about it. You see what I'm saying? See, you got to be well grounded. You got you got you got to be grounded in the truth. And, and so, as uh, the Lord Jesus says, "Do you have any meat?" No, certainly they didn't. When Jesus said, "Them children have any meat?" They answered him, "No." And he said to them, "Cast your net on the right side of the ship, and you shall find." And they cast therefore. And now they were not able to draw it for the multitude of fishes. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon heard that, heard that it was the Lord, he girded his, his fishers coat about him, for he was naked, and he cast himself into the sea. Now, two things about Peter here. Number one, <laughs> found him with nothing. Found him with no meat whatsoever. And found him naked. Is that how a Jewish boy was supposed to be? Did y'all listen to Adam? Got a quiz here in a few minutes. Did y'all listen to Adam last week? Where's the Jewish garment supposed to hit you? At least right here, right? What was he wearing? Nothing. Very, very prophetic, don't you think? Very indicating of who he was. Very, very much materialized. You know, he done denied the Lord, didn't know who he was, and says, No, I don't know not the man. Now he's running around naked like a well, like a Gentile. You know what? They didn't know. And we'll see in a minute they'll get down with Peter. Because see, that could be us tomorrow. That could be us huh, before the end of the day. We, we need to understand and know the, the way that we keep close to Christ is to keep in that book. The way that we keep close to Christ is to be, to be uh, with the Lord's people. The way that we keep close to Christ is to forsake not the assembling of ourselves together. That's how we keep close to Christ. But I want to I want to show you one more thing. Gospel of Matthew. Every one of you should quote it. I've read it probably a thousand times to you in my ministry here. Matthew sixteen sixteen. And Simon Peter answered and said, "Thou art the Christ." the Son of the living God. Now, I personally believe that Peter was saved. I personally believe both these instances he was already a saved man. Because the next verse says, Blessed are thou, Simon Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, that's a work of God and can't be denied if it's written that right, right? Yeah. So he was saved. So what does that tell Matthew? Do you plan to be running around on a fishing boat naked? 
No. Uh, no. <laughs> you think Peter had that plan? I don't think he did, do you? But it happened. I don't think he planned to be done into devil's fire and warming his hands, do you? But it happened. We don't plan to forsake the assembly, but it happens. You see, we uh, we need to. You know what? It costs something to serve the Lord. It costs. If you want a nearness, if you want a closeness, yes, it's going to be expensive. It's going to be expensive. It can be even expensive monetarily. Listen, gas is not cheap. Car repair is not not cheap either. Things are difficult. But if you want to be here, you'll be here. Right? So we... Uh, where, 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 where is your comfort zone? You remember, uh, I personally think it's when the Lord saved Moses. But how... How brave would you be to go look at the bush that burned but wasn't consumed? Would you be willing to get over there to it and look real close and see exactly what was going on? Because that's what he did. That's why he said, Moses, take your shoes off. You don't know the ground. And I believe he learned from that experience because when he went up on Moriah to receive the law, so he went up there full force, did he not? See, if you have experiences with Christ and you get close to Him, you'll begin to enjoy that stuff. Yeah. And, and you'll want to be around it more and more and more. So, are you satisfied out here? Or do you want to be here? Are you satisfied just kind of playing church? Or do you want to be enveloped with the person of Christ? Where did they first... Call them Christians. Did any of them, right? And why? They looked like, act like, and presented like Christ. It was a derogatory term. It wasn't. It was a complimentary. And uh, that's where we need to be. Are you close to Him this morning? Are you nearer to the Lord?